You gotta keep going. Keep going, keep going. At this school in Nova Scotia, students learn from indigenous elders and teachers in their community. How many understood what I said? What did, what did I say? And across the country in this Alberta public school. How many of you cut wood to stay warm in the winter? Culture, traditions, and history are woven throughout the day. What's that bird called? What's the name of that bird? But without a national mandatory curriculum, these teachings and experiences don't exist in all schools, despite the need and calls for it. Education is the key to change. Education is the only way to create real, long-term, sustainable change. It was the first, it was, it was the only one of its kind. That was always the vision for Pauline Shirt. She's an elder now and still leading the way, changing how children are taught in school about Indigenous people in Canada. And all of these are graduated. We need to educate people. What happened truly? Like so many Indigenous children, Pauline, her sisters and cousins were taken to a residential school in Alberta. Pauline was eight years old. They brought us in and the first thing they did was cut our hair. And to us, our hair is our power. They put some uh, kerosene on our hair. Kerosene, can you imagine? Schools where students were forced to assimilate, abused for their culture and for speaking their language. We weren't allowed to speak our language. We were told, this is, hey, this is who you're going to be. You're going to be like, you know, uh, to assimilate us, eh? Despite what she faced emotionally and physically, her spirit never dimmed. Decades later, as a parent, her daughters and sons were attending public school in Toronto and suffering terrible racism. She says her son Clayton would come home from school bloodied. You know, he was being bullied because he had long hair. And, and you know, he was the only Anishinaabe in there. They were really just horrible, horrible, horrible. They made them feel ashamed. They made them feel, you know, they were ill-treated. So in 1976, she started the first Indigenous school in Toronto with her late husband, Vern Harper. I started in the living room and I said, this is the start of our school. We're going to have our own school. Anybody heard of Nana Bozo? Yeah. They called it Kapapamachikwe, Wandering Spirit School. A good life for my children, a better life for my children, that they could, they don't have to come home crying or, you know, being met with racist attitudes. At the time, Vern described the school in a National Film Board documentary. This is the reason why it's so important that we see our history through our interpretation. Pauline took us back to her former home in an East Toronto neighborhood. This is where I started Wandering Spirit. It is a four bedroom apartment. The key, they determined what an authentic Indigenous education looked like. This was our school. Our curriculum was our way of life. We took them to places, uh, you know, land-based teaching. We took them to ceremonies. We took them to sweat lodges. We started something in here, something that will go on forever. Pauline's legacy continues in 18-year-old Ella Laforme. She was one of the first high school graduates from Wandering Spirit. The school is now JK to grade 12 and housed in a much bigger building in Toronto's East End. Ella started her education in a mainstream public school. She remembers being just 10 years old, having teachers call on her to explain Indigenous culture and history to the class. What did that feel like? I was like being put on the spot for like things I didn't know about. And then also if I, what, like, if I didn't tell them anything, it was almost like I was really disappointing them. And I felt like almost guilty, like I wasn't, like I should have been speaking about my culture even though I knew I couldn't because I didn't even know what they were talking about. Do you think the teachers had the right resources with what they were teaching no. you? We should just throw out all the textbooks, history textbooks, because it like makes me kind of upset. They only really talk about like the falling or the like eradication of Indigenous people and they only talk about us in past tense as if we aren't here anymore. We are like successful people who do successful things. The kids are fine, it's the adults who can't handle it. Charlene Bearhead is a longtime educator and advocate. Denial is a big issue. Um, I think that many Canadians and many 
non-Indigenous leaders have a really hard time wrapping their heads around the fact and accepting that the history that we've learned in our education systems across this country for 150 years has been inaccurate, has been biased. Education falls under the provinces and territories, so despite calls from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there is still no mandatory curriculum. What message does it send to Indigenous people if Indigenous education is not mandated in Canada? The message that it gives is Indigenous people are not important. Indigenous knowledge is not valid knowledge. It's not important to acknowledge the atrocities that have been perpetrated on Indigenous people. Even in the last year, there were incidents of public school students in different parts of the country being asked to describe the advantages or benefits of residential schools. There are still definitely, you know, bias and racist resources that are kicking around. They're not as easy to find, which is a good thing. We have been sort of trained to believe that if something's in writing, it must be true. And students see that it's so much harder to to get people to unlearn things. What's also key is who is teaching. It's everything we do is for the children. And how they are doing it. Indigenous people must be involved. Do we still have our cultures? Yeah. And resources must be authentic and accurate. I think uh, there are many people who are just not comfortable and they're afraid to do something wrong. But it's about relationship and it's about taking those risks and it's about learning, you know, and. And as educators, it's okay for us to admit that we don't know all of this because we weren't educated in this way. I had many friends growing up that were Indigenous that I had no idea what their ancestors went through. Janet Botterill teaches at Glen Allen Elementary in Edmonton. She's not Indigenous and says she never learned about the treatment and genocide of Indigenous peoples until she took a required teaching course in university. And that's where I first heard the term residential school. And that's where I thought, okay, what don't I know? What can I know? And how can I make sure that I help the community and make sure this never happens again? Oh, look at this, there's berries right here. We're here today in the forest because this is our university. Thank you, thank you. Committed to change, education at this school is developed entirely through partnerships. I want to teach you and with knowledge from Indigenous leaders. Abba Mustin. Give yourself a round of applause. Including Elder Wilson. You see these trees up here? Those ones are to keep you warm, make a fire for you. He's part of the lessons here. Ha, ha, ha. Hey, ho, ha. Sharing stories and underscoring the importance of protecting nature. And it's nice and bright, right? Central to Indigenous ways of life. Hi, hi. Thank you for sharing and being here today and being a part of this lesson um, and continuing to build your knowledge with an open heart. Most of the students here are not Indigenous. They're taught about the history of residential schools in Canada. Uh, I think it's sad because they weren't even allowed to speak their own language. Something that is still not consistent across the country. In the video too, you heard the man at the beginning. He said going to school, the first day of school was the hardest day of his life. Now, should coming to school be the hardest day of your life? It should not. I'll we'll give you a few minutes if you want to write or draw. Jeremy Albert shares his Cree language. Janet says one of the biggest challenges is that teachers don't know where to start and that they're afraid of making mistakes. A lot of people see it as, you know what, this is just a subject that I need to teach at this time and that's how it is and it's by itself. But really, you can intertwine um, Indigenous education into everything that you do, all of your daily practices. That's why in her school, teachers and school administrators meet regularly with elders to go over and refine their programming. Our students are the ones who are going to educate their parents, their friends, other people in the community. Lindia Isidore sees the change in her students. Have a nice day. She's an elementary teacher in Wamakook, Nova Scotia, on Cape Breton Island. Hi, honey. The school is part of the Mi'kmaq Ogamatnui School District. Do you remember the other day we were discussing about the importance of having black ash and white ash? 
20 years ago, only 30% of students graduated high school across the district. Now, it's over 90%. Remember? Walk. School administrators say that remarkable success is due to the jurisdiction and autonomy that the Mi'kmaq community has over how it teaches. They know more about their culture while they're in this community, so they feel connected. Does anybody know what a black ass looks like? Mi'kmaq language and culture are part of everything they do at this school. So the next page is, how do trees make their food? Remember we discussed that? To the emphasis on outdoor place-based education. Planting this tree is a commitment to Mi'kmaq culture, our history, and the future. As a child, Lindia attended a public school in a nearby community where racism and ignorance were rampant. I remember as a young girl, I'm like, what is it that makes me so ugly, so bad that makes me stick out? People would call me names. That was the kind of thing that was going through my head. But you could feel almost like a vibe of some of the teachers. Lindia knows the public school system across the country has work to do. Real and lasting change starts with education. She's now helping create a guide for teachers to use in public schools. I don't want any of the kids I know now to go through what I had to go through, but I also want them to have pride of who they are. Pride is what Ella says being a Wandering Spirit graduate gave her. She's now in her first year in university, studying psychology and advocating for Indigenous peoples and for better education. And you should tell people that, like, you're Indigenous and you're still here. You should be proud of who you are. Pauline is in her 80s now, but she's not stopping anytime soon. Look at beautiful, eh? Just gorgeous. There's sweet grass there. Outside the apartment where she launched that first school all those years ago, a memorial her son helped create to remember the residential school survivors. In the spirit of mutual healing, our canoe is in honor of all those who are affected by this experience. Pauline's work represents the future too. In the educational system, we have to accept me as a human being, accept your I'll accept you as a human being. That education has the power to change makes me feel proud, really feel proud that I am, that I have done my work. But it's not finished. <laughs>